Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webcast, Container Closure Integrity and Stability Testing for Rigid Containers. I'm Tim Wright, editor of Contract Pharma, and our webcast today is being sponsored by Nelson Labs. They're a global provider of microbiological and analytical lab testing services for uh, med tech and pharma companies. And our speaker today is Jennifer Gigi. She's an expert technical consultant at Nelson Labs. Uh, she has over 25 years of medical device lab experience and has worked in the microbiology, bio burden, IDs, and packaging sections at Nelson Labs. She has experience with various microbial tests, including microbial limits, plate counts, biological indicator population verifications, organism ID tests, and bio burden tests. Uh, she spent the last 15 years working in the packaging group as one of the original packaging group members at Nelson and she was heavily involved in validating all the packaging test methods and equipment and writing the test procedures for the packaging tests performed at Nelson. Uh, Jennifer is also a participating member on the ASTM F02 Committee for Packaging and is registered as a specialist microbiologist with ASM. Uh, today, Jen is going to be discussing stability and container closure integrity testing. Uh, she's going to outline the basics for setting up a stability test plan and dive into other key parameters as well. Uh, we will be accepting questions throughout the talk. You can send those in using the box at the lower left of your screen, and questions will be answered after the presentation in a brief Q&A. And this presentation will be archived on our website, contractpharma.com, for uh, one year. If you're experiencing any tech difficulties, you can type those into that question box as well, and someone uh, from the broadcast vendor will help you out. Uh, so at this point, I'll turn it over to you, Jen. Thanks. Um, welcome again to the Container Closure Integrity and Stability presentation. Uh, today, I'd like to take you on a journey through Container Closure Integrity and Stability testing to give you an overview of the options that are out there and some of the pros and cons of each of those options. Here's our agenda for today. We'll start with stability testing, and then we'll go through the different types of container closure, integrity, or CCI test methods. And we'll finish up with some thoughts on CCI test method validation, including a basic outline of what a typical validation would look like. Now, anything that needs to be sterile requires a package or a barrier to protect what's inside from contamination and to maintain the sterility. Sterile barrier packaging is governed by ISO 11607. Now this document has two parts. Part one is for validating packaging as a sterile barrier. And for this, you would test the sterile barrier for strength, integrity, and microbial barrier properties in both a new condition and at the end of its expected life. Now this shows that the sterile barrier will be effective at maintaining the sterility of what's inside until the expiry date. Uh, part two of ISO 11607 talks about validation of the packaging process. Here, the main component is that the packaging equipment has been validated to show that day after day it produces, produces a consistent package that's free from defects. The process validation tells us that the packaging starts out good, and we know from the packaging validation that if it starts out good, it will remain good until it expires. These are the standards related to, day, to today's presentation. ISO 11607 is the packaging document I just talked about. IHC is the stability document where you'll find information on how to perform stability testing. And USP 1207 is all about container closure integrity. So we're gonna start with stability testing. This quote from the IHC document explains why we perform stability testing. Stability testing is done on packaged pharmaceuticals to establish the storage conditions required to keep the drug stable, you know, keep it like new, and the length of time before it will change or expire. And we need to demonstrate two things. First, will the package or container keep the product free from contamination, both microbial and environmental? I mean, obviously, we want to avoid microbial contamination for the same reasons that medical devices need to be sterile. You know, we don't want any microbes that will make people sick if they take the drug. And if the drug compound uh, was very sensitive to moisture or oxygen, 
then a packaging failure could change the compound or affect the way the drug works. Second, we need to know if the drug product in ideal storage conditions and uncompromised packaging has changed over time. Compounds can degrade or change when exposed to different temperatures or lengthy periods of time. And this may change how a drug functions and reacts with the body. So we need to ensure that the drug has the same safety and effectiveness up until it's labeled expiration. The first step is stress testing. And this is where we expose the drug to increasing temperatures and see what happens. This will tell us if a compound can tolerate ambient storage or if it requires cold storage and at what temperature range it starts to break down, if any. Stress testing is done on a single batch. Now that we have an idea of the required storage conditions, we develop a test plan. First, we determine what testing will do on the product. This would usually be the same QC type test that would be done for batch release, and it includes physical, chemical, and biological attributes. Remember, this is the testing that shows that the drug product is the same over time. And then we would define our CCI testing. Now, this would include the CCI test method, the testing frequency, and the storage conditions. We'd also might want to consider the orientation. It's common to include maybe inverted and upright configurations as part of the test plan if there's a chance that the containers may not always be stored upright. And we need three production batches in the final packaging for this part of the validation. Based on the stress testing and expected storage of the product, we would select one of these three storage options long-term, intermediate, or accelerated. The last column has the minimum time point that we need data for before submission to the regulatory agency. Now, this is just a minimum. We would normally test through at least 12 months on the three batches. And as a note, if there's failures, you can go back to level one and start over. Now, this table in the slide is for ambient storage. If you're using refrigerated or frozen storage, you would want to store at your intended conditions for 12 months at a minimum. The testing frequency is outlined in the IHC guidelines. For the first year, we pull and test samples every three months. So baseline or time zero, uh, three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. Then the second year, the frequency goes to every six months. So we need to pull and test samples at 18 months and 24 months. And then if you go into a third year and beyond, you pull and test annually. At some point, you either stop testing and call that the expiration date, or you start having failures, and then you call the longest time point without failures as the expiration date. For stability testing, there's generally a large box of samples in storage. At each time point, the number needed for a set of CCI testing is removed. The CCI testing is done and hopefully it shows no leaks. And then the drug product is tested for those physical, chemical, and biological tests as listed in the test plan to show that the drug product is still the same. Now let's look at the CCI test methods. Uh, USP 1207 divides CCI testing into probabilistic methods and deterministic methods. So what are the differences between the two? I've got some lovely dictionary definitions for probabilistic and deterministic here on this slide. Except it didn't, let's see, there we go. There's the second one. Um, probabilistic methods are destructive. Let's see, wait. Now, in simple terms, uh, probabilistic methods are qualitative or pass fail methods, and they're usually based on observations by humans. Um, deterministic methods are quantitative where there's a measured value that's generated by a machine. So that's kind of the basic difference between those two. Um, this slide here shows how probabilistic and deterministic methods are, they're really just complete opposites. Where probabilistic methods are destructive, deterministic methods are non-destructive. Where probabilistic methods are slow and less sensitive, deterministic methods are fast and more sensitive. Where probabilistic methods are cheaper to set up, deterministic methods require costly instruments. 
And finally, where probabilistic methods can't tell you what a leak size is, deterministic methods can often estimate a leak size based on the numerical results. Uh, these are the CCI test methods that are listed in USP 1207. Just for reference, Nelson Labs offers bubble emission, mass extraction, dye immersion, and bacterial immersion testing. Uh, we'll be going over uh, each method individually today, but first I want to break down the basics of how these methods work because, you know, when you look at them closely, you'll find that they're actually very similar. The probabilistic methods look like this. There's some kind of an indicator, whether it's air, dye, or microbes, or maybe a gas, and then we create a pressure differential using either a vacuum or pressure. And then this indicator moves through any defects. And then we do some kind of evaluation. And it's usually visual. And it's like, do I see bubbles? Or is there dye inside the container? Or is there microbial growth in a previously clear media? Or is there some indicator of a gas? And this will tell us if the, uh, the result is a pass or a fail. The deterministic methods break down into two different categories. Option one applies to high voltage leak detection and laser head space. There is an emitter of some sort that sends a signal through the test sample. And then on the other end, there's a detector that picks up the signal and then interprets that signal as either a leak or not based on a pre-established numerical pass-fail threshold. The second deterministic option applies to mass extraction pressure and vacuum decay or leak, and vacuum mode tracer gas. In this option, the sample is placed into a fitted chamber and a pressure differential is created using either vacuum or pressure, and then the air is passed through a detector, which measures for something, maybe mass detector, maybe it's a volumetric flow detector or a helium detector, and then that measurement is interpre interpreted by the tester as a leak or not, based on pre-established numerical pass-fail threshold. And now, it's time to look at each test method individually. For each method, I have a quick scorecard. Bubble emission, like most probabilistic methods, is destructive and it takes minutes to run. The test sensitivity is 250 microns, which is the largest by far of all the methods. Now, this one kind of surprises me that it's on a list of pharma uh, testing because we normally run bubble testing on flexible packaging like pouches and trays. And when I think of CCI testing, I'm usually thinking about vials and syringes. But this method could easily be run on a pharma container. There are two standards for bubble testing, ASTM F2096 is an inside out method where the air is added to the inside of the package while it's submerged in water to create the pressure differential. Then we visually look for bubbles escaping as evidence of leaks. The picture on the top is an example of this test in action. And this is the method that we run here at Nelson Labs. ASTM F3078 is an outside in method where the package is submerged in liquid in a vacuum chamber. And then the vacuum is drawn on the chamber, which creates a pressure differential and forces air through any leaks. Now, these are also seen as bubbles escaping from the package. And this picture here on the bottom is an example of this type of test equipment. The microbial challenge by immersion is the only method that can't be done on finished product. The containers must be filled with the bacterial growth medium so we can visually detect growth of the challenge organism which is Bravundimonas diminuta at Nelson Labs. Now, there's no established sensitivity for this test, but uh, we chose diminuta for its small size. It's one of a few organisms that's small enough to routinely pass through a 0.2 micron filter. Now, note the test time here, because this test requires time to grow the stock culture and incubate the samples after exposure. This test takes weeks to run, which is by far the longest test time. This is the Nelson Labs bacterial immersion test chamber, which is capable of both pressure and vacuum. To run the test, the B. diminuta is grown under specific media and incubation conditions 
to encourage it to be as small as possible. A broth suspension of diminuta is placed into the chamber and the test samples are submerged in the broth. The pressure differential is created using either pressure and or vacuum. And then after the exposure, the samples are removed from the broth and then the outside surfaces are cleaned and the samples are incubated for a week. And then they're scored for evidence of microbial growth by looking visually for turbidity in the growth media. Tracer gas, when used in a sniffer mode, is considered a probabilistic method. Depending on how the test is set up, it may or may not be destructive. The test time depends on how long it takes to slowly move the sniffer probe across the entire test surface. So if you have a larger area to examine, then it's going to take longer to run the test. The sensitivity will vary depending on the test setup, the sensitivity of the detector, and the technique of the analyst. This method can be used either as an outside-in or an inside-out method. The picture on the top shows the test sample. In this case, it's a cylinder of gas, and it's filled with this tracer gas. Then the sniffer probe is manually moved along the outside to look for leaks. If there is tracer gas escaping from a leak, then the probe will detect it. Uh, this type of setup will identify leak locations but it's going to be a little more subjective and reliant on the analyst's technique and skill. This type of setup would also be non-destructive. The bottom picture shows the opposite approach. Here, the gas is added to the outside of the test sample, which is connected directly to the detector. If the detector picks up any tracer gas, then it's come through a leak. And in this test setup, we can't determine a defect location. And this test setup would also be destructive, since the closure is broken when the sample is disconnected from the detector. Our last probabilistic method on the list is tracer liquid, or diimmersion as we call it. Uh, this test takes hours, and it has a sensitivity of 10 to 20 microns, which is pretty good for a probabilistic method. And diimmersion is destructive, like other probabilistic methods. This test isn't based on a standard method, so the exposure parameters, maybe the vacuum level, um, the hold time, and the type of tracer dye that is used is going to vary from lab to lab. Samples are submerged in the dye, and then the pressure differential is created to move the dye through any defects. Uh, after the exposure, the samples are then examined for dye. The examination is usually done visually, but an instrument can be used to increase the limit of detection of the dye in the solution inside the container. Now, Nelson Labs uses a UV viz, and we've also got a dye with a characteristic wavelength, and that helps us increase our detection limit of the dye about tenfold over just looking at it visually. And being able to see minute concentrations of dye doesn't affect the test sensitivity since that's based on the smallest size defect the dye will pass through, but it does allow dye detection at very low concentrations. For high voltage, oh wait, that wraps up our probabilistic methods. And that brings us to our first deterministic method, which is electrical conductivity or high voltage leak detection. Now, as we look at the scorecards for these methods, they're going to start looking like a broken record. All right, they're all very, very similar. Um, all these deterministic methods are non-destructive. They all have test times in the seconds, which makes them ideal for inline inspection. And every one of these deterministic methods has been implemented in some manufacturing line somewhere in the world for 100% inspection. Now, and they also all have test method sensitivities of maybe 10 microns or less. For high voltage leak detection, uh, the packaging needs to be non-conductive, and the product needs to be conductive. Now, the good news here is that glass, which is the most common um, packaging material, is non-conductive. And water, which tends to be the base for most of these pharmaceuticals, is conductive. And so this method is really applicable for most pharmaceutical applications. This is the emitter detection option that we discussed earlier. And here the emitter is sending out an electrical current. The detector is measuring that current, and if there's a change or a spike in current, then that indicates a leak. Uh, 
In the picture on the left, the vial is rotated and moved side to side, so the entire bottle is scanned. And then in the picture on the right, which is kind of a little bit different setup, multiple emitters are used while the syringe is rotated to cover the entire surface. Now, one of the best things about this emitter detector type of setup is that there's no plugging effect from protonaceous compounds or particles as you can sometimes see in a vacuum method where a defect may be partially blocked and therefore not detected. One of the drawbacks is that you're usually looking for leaks in the glass only and not really evaluating the closure. And I think you can see that illustrated in, in both of these example photos. The other detector emitter method is laser headspace. This scorecard looks the same as all the rest, except we don't have an ASTM standard in the works yet. The emitter here is a laser, and the detector uses the laser signal to determine gas concentration. And it's usually looking for oxygen concentration, but it can also be set up for some other gases. Now this test was primarily designed for products packaged under alternate atmospheres. And a leak is detected if the oxygen concentration inside the container is different than normal or ambient air. So if a container is sealed under ambient air conditions, then every vial essentially looks like a leak. But we can fix this uh, by conditioning the samples in nitrogen prior to testing. So the nitrogen enters the containers that have any leak pathways, uh, and then that would change the oxygen concentration inside. But doing that adds time, maybe another day, to the test time, and then the samples would need to be scanned immediately after removal from the nitrogen chamber or all the leaks are just going to equilibrate back to the same oxygen level. Now, one really a good thing about this test is that it's the only one that can detect leaks in ultra-cold storage. Again, this only works if the container was originally sealed in an alternate atmosphere. And sometimes when you store uh, vials with rubber stoppers at really cold conditions like minus 70 C, the stopper may contract slightly or shrink, causing a leak around the closure. When the vial is brought to room temperature, the rubber returns to its original size and then seals the closure. If you test this vial using any other CCI method, it'll pass because it's currently sealed. Only laser headspace will detect the increased oxygen levels that occurred during ultra-cold storage while the stopper was more shrunken. Now, one drawback here with this test method is that there needs to be a visible headspace for the laser to pass through. And this does eliminate some container types from using this method. The picture on the top in the slide is a bench top tester. And the picture on the bottom is an example of how this would be set up for an inline um, manufacturing test. Now we're transitioning over to those option two deterministic methods or those vacuum based methods where we create a pressure differential to detect leaks. Uh, we will start with mass extraction, which is my personal favorite. And that's really because it's the method we use here at Nelson. And I was heavily involved with selecting our first deterministic method and getting the method validated and set up for routine testing. Now, I, I, you might be thinking, if there's so many similarities between deterministic methods, then why did Nelson pick mass extraction? Well, we selected mass extraction in part because of the great folks at Advanced Test Concepts, or ATC, who pioneered the technology. Their technology appealed to us for its versatility with different product types, and the calibrated leak orifice was a huge selling point for us as well. They were a great vendor to work with, and now that we've had the equipment for a few years, I still love it. It's been very reliable, easy to use, and ATC, which is now Pfeiffer Vacuum, has always been responsive and helpful. Like other vacuum-based methods, mass extraction needs custom fixtures that are fitted to the sample. The amount of free space in the chamber will affect the method sensitivity and overall test time. This is the Nelson Labs uh, mass extraction tester here. The silver cylinder on the top of the instrument is the vial uh, test chamber. The sample is placed into the test chamber and a vacuum is drawn to remove the air from the chamber. After stabilization is reached, the airflow is diverted into a detector which measures mass flow. The final mass flow value is compared to a pass-fail threshold value 
If you're above the value, then the sample fails. And if you're below the value, then the sample passes. My favorite part about mass extraction, again, is that the instrument has this built-in calibrated defect. This eliminates the need to create known defects for testing, either by sending out samples for laser drilling or maybe inserting microcapillaries directly into the vial. This CLO, or calibrated leak orifice, is run with every test set, so we have a flow value for a defect of known size included with every set for comparison. Vacuum and pressure leak or decay has a lot of different options. The pressure differential can be created using pressure or vacuum, and the method can be set up as either an outside-in or an inside-out type of method. If it's a leak method, then the final flow is measured and compared to a pass-fail threshold value. If it's a decay method, then the vacuum or pressure is held for a period of time, and if that pressure or vacuum remains constant, then it passes, and if it drops or increases more than a certain amount, it would fail. This equipment is for a vacuum leak or a decay tester. The picture at the bottom shows the inside of this particular test chamber, and you can see that this one is fitted for an oval container. The sample would be placed into this chamber, and then the vacuum would be drawn to remove the air. Again, once stabilization is reached, the air is diverted through a volumetric flow detector. It's measured and then compared to a pass-fail threshold value. The last one on the list is tracer gas in the vacuum mode. When we talked about tracer gas as a probabilistic method, we were using the sniffer probe, which was manually moved around the test area to detect the tracer gas. For the vacuum mode, the test system is contained so that none of the tracer gas can mix with the atmosphere and be diluted. Uh, I'm also creating a pressure differential to move the tracer gas through any defects. Helium is the most commonly used tracer gas. Uh, some reasons for this is that it's very inert and non-reactive. It's lighter than air, and it's readily detectable and very distinguishable from other gases. It's also only present in small amounts in the atmosphere, and these are great characteristics that are making it ideal as a tracer gas. Uh, the tracer gas can be inside the container or can be outside. In the top picture, the container is attached to a detector, and the tracer gas is then going to be inside that vacuum vessel. Then as the vacuum is drawn, the tracer gas will be pulled through any defects and into the test container and then consequently through the detector. In the bottom picture, the test sample has the tracer gas inside, and the sample is placed in the vacuum vessel, and the vacuum's drawn, and then the air would go through a sensor that would detect any tracer gas that escaped from the part into the chamber. Some key points to remember when choosing a container closure integrity test. First, deterministic methods are preferred over probabilistic methods for their increased sensitivity and measured results. Second, all of the deterministic method options have great sensitivity, but each method sensitivity will vary depending on a number of factors. How well do your fixtures fit the sample? A tighter fit will increase the sensitivity. How well does the chamber design allow for quick and complete evacuation of the air? A longer time to evacuate would decrease the sensitivity. What is your container design? Now, there are certain container features that are harder to evacuate the air from, and certain closures may not be as airtight as others. Again, extending the evacuation phase time, it will decrease the sensitivity, and some of these closures may need a less sensitive method because they're really not completely airtight. Um, how sensitive is your detector? A more sensitive and accurate detector will, of course, give you better sensitivity for the test. So it's kind of impossible to say which method is the most sensitive or the best overall, but it is very fair to say that any method can be made more sensitive or less sensitive depending on how it's set up and how it's executed. And this is why we're listing the, method, the, the sensitivity as a general range and not really an absolute value. Finally, there are certain methods that have advantages that may be useful in certain situations, 
And if your sample type falls into one of these types of special categories, that really would have an influence on your choice of which method is best for you. Now, once you've chosen your CCI test, you need to set up the method and validate that method with your specific container. And let's look at how this would generally be done. After choosing the CCI method, we need to optimize the test setup. All the deterministic methods need custom fixtures, whether it's a vacuum chamber that's fitted and sized to the product, or maybe a holding fixture that places the product exactly between the emitter and detector. Uh, we may need special adapters or fillers if we're trying to use the fixture for multiple sample types. Once we've got the equipment set up figured out, then we're gonna look at the test parameters. The test parameters control how the test is run, and what steps happen and how long each step takes, and also how the end measured value is converted to a pass-fail result. A vacuum-based method starts with a quick evacuation to remove the air between the chamber and the test container. Once stabilization is reached, the air is measured, whether it's mass flow or volumetric flow or a gas concentration. And this method needs to be customized so that the air in the chamber is evacuated before the measurement happens, but it can't be too long or the air will also be removed from the container we're testing through any defects. And then when that measurement actually does happen, there's nothing left inside the container to detect. And so we would get a false, um, a false passing. So we need to make sure we've covered that. And then we need to determine the baseline signal or the baseline flow of a non-leaking container whether this is a flow value or gas concentration or maybe an electrical signal, you know, we need to know what that expected result is for a non-leaking container in this particular test setup. And this is done by testing known good parts or non-leaking parts using a known equipment setup and test parameters, and then we get an average value. Once we've established our baseline for good parts, then we start looking at defects. Uh, we need defect parts with a known defect size so we can establish what the result value is for a specific defect size. Now, this can be done with a calibrated leak standard um, or with confirmed defects made in the actual product container. The defect size should be the expected sensitivity of the test, which is usually going to be in maybe the 2 to 10 micron range. And there needs to be a distinct difference between the results for good parts and defective parts so we can reliably distinguish between the two types. Validation testing is usually done by different analysts on different days, and since deterministic methods are non-destructive, the same set of samples can be used repeatedly for all the validation runs. And this does help us eliminate variability between sample sets and allows us to focus on how consistent the instrument is when used by different operators at different times. Now, hopefully, we see that the method works well regardless of when or who is doing the testing and that we consistently get the same results on our sample set. After the validation testing is complete, the results are analyzed and the pass-fill value is chosen as a value somewhere between the average value of the defect sample and the average value for the baseline or the good samples. Uh, so, it's got to be higher than the value we're expecting for a passing sample, but lower than the value that we expect for a failure with the specific size defect that we're using. Now, here's a graph of some mass extraction data to kind of help visualize how we would set a pass-fail threshold. The non-leaking parts all have final flow values between 0 and 3, and most of them, you can see a nice little cluster here, are below 1. Now, you'll always see some variability even in non-leaking parts, which is why it's important to have, to have a statistically significant sample size in your set. And this graph here uh, only shows one two micron defect result because this is routine test data. But if this were a validation data set, we would have a number of defect flow rates to analyze. And just like our good parts, those would also not be exactly the same value. Um, in this one here example, uh, our defect flow is about 12. Our pass-fail threshold value for this method was set at about five and a half. And you can see in the graph 
that the pass-fail threshold is really somewhere between the expected good part and the expected defect part. You can also see from the graph that the defect results and the good uh, non-leaking results are very distinguishable. I've got a cluster of the good parts and there's quite a difference between the good parts and the bad parts. Now, if you choose to make defects in your actual product containers, it's best if you can verify those defects through a secondary means. If you don't detect a defect in your validation, it's either because the defect wasn't really as defective as it, as it was supposed to be, or because the test setup just wasn't um, set up well enough to be able to detect it. Now, each type of a defect that we can create in samples has potential issues. The smaller the laser drill hole, the harder it is to create accurately. The flow through a laser drill hole will also change as the depth of the hole increases. So a 10 micron hole in a thin material would act like a 10 micron hole, but maybe a 10 micron hole in a really thick material might act something more like a five or a two micron hole, depending on how, um, how much thicker it was. Now we can mitigate this by drilling a larger hole and then we measure the effective hole size uh, using some flow measurements. Uh, another note, uh, as in the picture on the top right, the position of the laser drilled holes should also be considered. You can see different results based on if the hole is in the neck or the side or the bottom. Um, microcapillaries and microtubes are prone to breaking, which greatly increases their effective hole size. Now the picture here in the slide on the bottom is a microcapillary tip. Uh, is highly magnified. Uh, for reference, the base diameter on the microcapillary, as seen in the bottom corner, will fit inside, inside of a 16 gauge needle. So these are very tiny. Those tips are extremely small. When we insert microcapillaries, it's very hard to do without breaking them. And since these chambers are fitted, remember we don't want to have a lot of free space in there, there's often maybe not enough clearance to use them. Uh, the biggest challenge, though, with microcapillaries is that there's a lot of variability in the hole size. Just to give you an example, I made up 40 microcapillaries of the same size for a validation, and then I tested them. While over half had flows between 12 and 14, which is a pretty decently tight range, uh, the, the overall range of all 40 was something like 8 to 32. Now, by flow checking the larger group, I was able to remove the outliers and create, create a nice uniform set of 10 for my validation. But it does illustrate the variability that you'll typically see with microcapillaries. And wires, another option people uh, like to use. Uh, if you put a wire between the stopper and the glass, it, it's kind of difficult to, to gauge the effective hole size. The wire diameter isn't really the hole size, but it's the gap that they are creating in the closure. And if you want to use wires, you'd have to first determine the effective hole size by sealing various diameter wires and then testing them to try and figure out which would be the right size for your validation. Again, one last plug for mass extraction, where there's a calibrated leak defect that's built into the equipment. So there's a known defect that can be added to any sample at any time to see what that flow value looks like in a defect of known size. Now, I really think that the best defect option out there is to have some kind of a built-in defect. And I'm hoping that the other equipment manufacturers for some of these other methods will look at adopting something similar for their equipment as well. Well, that wraps up this presentation on container closure integrity and stability testing. And since I have your attention here for a minute, I'd just like to mention that I work in the Nelson Advisory Services Group and just remind everyone of all the technical consulting services that we offer both through Nelson Labs and our sister company, Sterigenics. Uh, if you need any assistance, we're here to help. Uh, I hope this webinar has been informative and beneficial to everyone. Uh, I've got my contact here, information here on this last slide if you uh, need to get a hold of me. And it looks like we have some time left for questions. So I'll turn it back over to Tim and if we want to want to do some questions yeah great thanks jen um really great talk really informative uh got a good audience uh participation here questions are kind of flowing in um if you do have a question for jen and 
didn't get a chance to uh, type it in, now is the time you want to go ahead and do so. Uh, so let's jump right in here. Um, okay, our first attendee would like to know, what is the recommended CCI technique for glass containers closed with child-resistant screw caps? Uh, screw caps become a little bit more difficult because um, when you have screw caps, that's one of those special container types where sometimes it's harder to evacuate all the air out. It takes a little bit of time for, you know, to get through the twisting closure. You kind of have a little bit of a torturous path created there. I think any of these deterministic methods would work. Again, nobody really um, says you have to use one method. They're just saying, please use a good CCI method to, to test for leaks. Uh, if you have problems with a vacuum method because uh, because of the, the twist closure, then I would maybe look at at either uh, the the high voltage leak detection or the laser headspace. But again, the the laser headspace uh, you're probably packaging this under normal ambient air conditions, and so then you'd have to do some kind of uh, conditioning in order to get that method to work. But I really think you could probably use any of them. You just okay. might have to make a few special considerations because of the closure type. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, let's see here, we'll get rid of that one, moving along. Um, are the methods being discussed relevant to plastic bottles? Yes, they're really for rigid containers. So they would be relevant for plastic bottles. Again, though, like if you had an opaque plastic, then you wouldn't have a visible window for a laser headspace to work. But they would work uh, just fine with any of the uh, any of the vacuum-based methods. Probably wouldn't work with uh, electrical conductivity because, again, uh, I don't know that the pla I think the plastic's pretty non-conductive. So I'd okay. go for vacuum-based methods on a plastic container. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see here. This attendee would like to know, is there a guideline for using a certain pressure value per container? No, there there really isn't. Obviously, you when you're doing your method set up in the validation uh, and you've got controls, positive and negative controls, you can look and see if the parameters that you've chosen for your test are sufficient. Uh, just to kind of give you an example, when we've done dye immersion, uh, we use a really high vacuum. It's pretty much as high as we can uh, get with the equipment that we've got. And that's all fine and dandy uh, for a vial that's got a crimp, clap, crimp cap closure. But when you get to a syringe, sometimes those vacuum pressures are so great that they just like pop the stopper out of the back of the syringe. And that's really not a measure of whether or not it's leaking. That's just, oh, the vacuum's too high. And that's right. the kind of thing that you would determine in your validation. You need to have parameters that are severe enough that you can pick up the defects, but not too severe that it, um, it basically ruins your test. Okay. All right, great. Uh, let's see here. Next attendee, as mass extraction is a favorite at Nelson, is it selected for testing flexible container closure systems such as 100 milliliter to 6 liter solution drug containers? Or is the method more appropriate for rigid CCS? I have seen examples of uh, mass extraction and all these other vacuum-based methods used for flexible packaging. Uh, again, it's, it's not something that uh, you can um, that you can just do, you'd have to validate the method to make sure that you had a method. You'd need a special container. Uh, like the one picture that I showed for the vacuum leak, uh, that looks to me like that's a tray. So technically that would be a flexible packaging, but you need to have a specialized chamber that's fitted to that, that has enough restraints to keep it from flexing too much so that uh, you can get stabilization in your vacuum. Um, and right now, mass extraction at Nelson Labs is really set up for uh, vials and syringes and auto injectors. Uh, we are looking, we've done a little experimental work with um, flexible IV bags, but we, we don't offer that yet. So maybe in the future, we would have 
flexible packaging options with the method. The technology is certainly capable of it. It's just not something that we have validated for use right now at, at Nelson Labs. Okay. Um, great. Let's see here. Uh, is there any feedback from regulatory bodies when using a calibrated leak orifice and not a true positive control constructed in the actual product being tested? We haven't personally gotten any feedback, positive or negative, on that. We have had some clients that have um, have tried to get us to put defects in. And again, it, we do have lots of people that will maybe uh, laser drill holes, and then they'll send those in to see if those holes would get picked up. And that's probably the best type of an option, or maybe a wire option. Uh, when you try to use microcapillaries in a vacuum-based method, CCI test where those chambers are so fitted, uh, you have trouble because that microcapillary has to stick out a certain distance, and sometimes you just don't have enough clearance for it. So we haven't gotten any pushback from regulatory agencies about using the calibrated leak orifice, um, but I also haven't had a direct conversation with anyone over at FDA about what their feelings on it are. I personally like it because I know that it's the same every time, whereas I have a lot of variability um, any time that I make a new one. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see here, moving along. This attendee would like to know if, can you repeat the three components of CCIT, stability testing, et cetera? Uh, the three components. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're testing. referring to a specific slide that you're on. I'm, I'm not sure. They don't specify. Oh, that is a hard one to answer then. We can just move on and you can uh, follow up with them directly if you'd prefer. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. When, okay. when I'm looking at three, the only slide that I had was with the three different uh, storage conditions for stability testing. And okay. really, that's going to be dependent on what your stress testing shows you is the tolerance of your um, of your of your product, and and you don't have to do all three of those. You would just you can just select one. But sometimes people okay. like to do the accelerated so they can get some data a little faster. Gotcha. Okay, we'll move along here. Uh, what is the smallest vial you would test? We, we're we set up, our smallest file is, I, I can't tell you exactly what size it is, but it's the one that uh, we use on the GC. So it's it's not very big. It's a probably a one mil pill vial. And it's, okay. you know, less than half an inch in diameter. It's, you know, maybe an, an inch to an inch and a half in height. They're really tiny. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, this attendee asks, what is the recommended CCIT for a lure lock syringe capped with a port cap for use in cell therapies? Um, are vacuums necessary for the probabilistic test methods? Uh, vacuum methods are, they're going to be a little bit more tricky when you're dealing with a, a closure that's not airtight. Uh, and they said, I think, that they had a vented cap. If you're going to use a vacuum method when you don't have a completely airtight closure, then you have to try and adjust the method so that um, it's not very sensitive or less sensitive. And so it can detect the difference between a leak that's bigger than the leak that you have naturally from the vented cap. And so they're a little more challenging to do. Uh, if you wanted to try uh, the laser head space, if you have head space in your syringe, some syringes don't, that would also be a, a good option because that one isn't going to really care about whether your cap is vented or not. That's just that, that that's just looking straight at oxygen concentration. But again, same thing, if you're not under an ambient atmosphere, then you you run you you run into a little problem because your cap is vented. So you'd have to establish what uh, what the conditioning with nitrogen would look like in leaking and non-leaking samples. So you, you could probably do anything. It's just it's going to be a little bit more tricky because you have the vented cap. 
to get the validation done. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, let's see, I think we've got a couple more here. Uh, this attendee asks, what should be the concentration of microorganisms uh, in the test solution during microbial immersion testing? And they reference B. Demunta as the microorganism. They, they usually, I don't think there, there isn't really a standard for microbial ingress testing. Um, it's based on concepts again. And so the organism to use, many people are going to use the Diamonuda because it is one of those really small organisms. And when you don't have a standard that tells you exactly what the method parameters are, you're going to get variability from lab to lab. I would say generally most people are going to be a above a 10 to the 6, and that's probably based on the fact that if you're at that kind of a concentration or higher, you can really see the turbidity in your broth and you know that you have, um, that you have the organisms there. <laughs> if you have a lower concentration, then you, you may not, and everybody likes to be higher, right, because the higher your concentration, the the, the more challenging they feel that the test is. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, we got one more question here. Um, this audience member asks, what kind of defect you will make for the microbial challenge validation controls? Uh, when we do it here, they put a needle. I think it's a 22 gauge needle that they'll put in. So that is a really large defect. Okay. Um, let's see, I think that's gonna take us to the end of our audience question. We did have uh, one audience member ask, they joined late and if there's gonna be a recording of the webinar. And uh, yes, you're gonna, if you're registered, you will receive a link from us with uh, a recording of the webinar. Um, so no worries. Um, so, uh, no more questions coming in from the audience. I'm going to go ahead and conclude today's presentation. And uh, thanks, Jen, for a really great informative talk. Um, thank you again to Nelson Labs for the sponsorship. And thank you, everybody in the audience, for your attendance. And um, in addition to getting an email with the link to this talk, we will also be archiving this session on our website, contractpharma.com, for one year. Uh, so thanks very much, everybody, for joining us. And have a great rest of your day. Take care.